Welcome to the Nerdist Podcast number 821. What? 821? No. You know what? It worked Doesn't, better it for worked, the first one. It worked better one. in the last yeah. episode. Yeah, new day, new problems. We're doing 820. It's 821 great. doesn't work. 821 doesn't really. If you don't understand this run, go look at the previous episode. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I only listen if I like the guests. And on Hostfuls, guess what? I don't like the guests. Oh, no. Yeah. Sorry. What? What? Oh, you don't listen to anything, then. I'm the internet. I don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> My preferences are your problem. Oh, wait. That doesn't... Really? That's not how life works, Well, then sir. I guess you're insecure, because you can't handle criticism. But, no, I'm just saying that I'm just doing this thing, and I don't... You don't have Whatever, to... bro, all caps! Oh, <laughs> God, all caps. It really means it. Yeah, I was real mad. Uh, I'm very excited to uh, introduce Katie Levine of the Nerdist Podcast producing fame. Uh, she's going to take us now to the Nerdist Community Corkboard desk. Katie, uh, what is pinned up on the corkboard today in the newsroom? We have two very exciting posts. Uh, first of all, the hilarious Kyle Kinane and Dave Stone have a podcast called The Boogie Monster. In it, they talk about aliens, ghosts, Bigfoot, paranormal activity, but they also talk a lot about barbecue and fried chicken Sounds and shit fantastic. that they enjoy. Uh, they're both hilarious, So, and I'm sure everyone that listens to this loves them. It comes out every Tuesday. It's available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play. Good for them. Yeah. Making it happen. And then also, last year we did um, we did a team Nerdist for the Best Friends Strut Your Mutt event. Strut and we're going to do it again this year. It's October 22nd in Exposition Park in I don't know L.A. I feel about all this mutt strutting. Mm. But, but, everyone, but Scout's a mutt, and she loves to strut. I just mean... Bozo Why do you want to put these dogs in pageants? Bozo. You put makeup on them and oh the make There's no makeup. We're just strutting Maybe for both. fun. Oh, okay. It's fun okay. strut. I think Bo might right. strut this year. Right. I, I, you and Bo should absolutely be there. Yep. Um, you know, ever, anyone can join the Nerdist you team. Work it, girl. <laughs> you, you better work it, girl. Anyone can join the Nerdist team. Again, it's October 22nd in Exposition Park in L.A. But it, it, you can also do, you know, virtual walk if you don't live in L.A. Or you can check out their site and find where they do it. They're doing them in other cities, and it's only $25 to join the team, and all the money goes to homeless animals. To find out more info or join the team, go to nerdi.st slash team. I'm, gonna, I'm, go, I'm going to uh, strut your hut where you, you can uh, bring Anubis. take different huts. Uh, uh, it seems like a, you like take them on a party you can pleasure take, barge. Like, Jabba to like a pleasure barge. <laughs> you can just strut them back and forth. And oh, that's just, interesting. Or yeah. pizza huts uh, huts too, allowed yeah. as well. Well, there's a whole there's a whole hut lore if you if you if you jump down the Wikipedia. Uh, you wormhole. know what, Chris? I'd rather not. Well, all right. There was one hut. You know, normally they're criminals, Matt, but there was one hut who was actually a Jedi. There was one hut that was a Jedi. <sighs> So how would he wield a lightsaber with those tiny arms? Well, he just knew how to strut his hut. Did he work out? Was he like, is there, what is the, I want to know, what is like the normal body weight of a hut? Like, do they all, do you think, do you think Job is like a little, oh, I think he might've let himself go a little bit, but they are giant slug like creatures. That's true. But I feel so. like in Star Wars, you know, the original Star Wars picture. Hey, real slugs have curves, Matt. Listen, in, in A New Hope, when he visits Han, you feel like he's very slim. He's very small, and I think Han like walk. I think Han like walks through his tail. Walks over him. Yeah, yeah. In a in a in a way that is like he phases when, through when, him. It, it looks like when Poochie leaves Earth. That's how shitty the effects were. I must go back to my you home planet. You have to go now. watch it because like the way they make Harrison Ford. Just jump over because he walks yeah. around the actor who was. I remember seeing that. it going, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's and really how did weird. Jabba Jabba like real like weird. quadrupled in size between then and there? Well, I mean, you know, whatever he's putting back, I'm sure it wasn't a healthy. I'm lifestyle. sure Wikipedia has it. There are two e's in Wookie, by the way. Stop fucking misspelling that internet. <laughs> Thank you. Because uh, otherwise, you're just saying Wokey. This episode is uh, Seth Rogen. Who is goddamn delightful, Seth Rogen? Great laugh. Oh, I love his gosh. laugh. I just love hearing. It's him not just a laugh. So he's just a good guy. Seth's just a good guy, and it <laughs> makes me happy. Fine gentleman. It makes me happy when good people succeed. And Seth is a Seth is an industry all all unto himself, and I could not be happier for him. I'm so such a nice guy, and uh, he's promoting Sausage Party, which is uh, great. It's filthy. It's uh, an animated food movie that's filthy that you should see the billboards for it are everywhere they are and uh, it opens august 12th i haven't seen it yet but i'm very much looking forward to seeing it you absolutely august 12th. need to see it august 12th uh seth rogan this episode of the nerds podcast sponsored to you by audible 
Audible.com. Uh, love Audible.com. Why do you love them, man? Because I can listen to audio content wherever and whenever I want. Oh, my God. I had no idea. Like that's, on that's your true. long drives? Like on my long drives, I can listen to 19-hour like books. How you'll go, like you'll drive to Vegas to play roulette for an hour and then drive home? Uh, you know, I try to keep it at like six hours <laughs> and then drive home. I got to make it worth it. You know, I don't want to be in the car for eight hours for only three hours, but six hours is fine. What's the most you've ever come home with? From Las Vegas? Yeah. Like seven thousand dollars. That's great. You know, it was a day. Doesn't even phase you. No, because I know what I lose. <laughs> Will you ever make it up? Uh, I've recently got into prop betting, so I think no. There is a. Uh, there, I'm sure there's some sort of a betting book that you could listen to. You know, for, I've I've listened to actually a number of poker books. You know, because I play in a weekly poker game. I've listened to a number of like Jonathan Little has a great poker book. I'll plug that. Jonathan Little. Uh, uh, no Limit Hold'em poker book is, is fantastic. Why didn't he just call it a little bit of poker? I mean, like that seems like God the perfect damn it. title. Jonathan Little, right why didn't you do that? Yeah. Ugh. Or going to the John on poker. Uh, poking on the John. John poking poker. on the John. That's a, there's a name for that. Poker, Pokemon. I like to play Pokemon Go. Uh, this app is free. The Audible app, it works on all of your devices. You can download and listen on Kindle Fire if you want. Play MP3 players if you still just have an MP3 player. And unlike a streaming or rental service, you own your books. So you can access them anytime. No one's going to come in and go, hey, those are actually ours. We're taking away your account. They're not going to do that. They're not going to do that at all. They're not going to do that at all. Uh, and just for listeners, Audible.com is offering a free 30-day trial membership. Go to Audible.com slash Nerdist. Start your free trial. Show your support for the Nerdist podcast and get a free 30-day trial at Audible.com slash Nerdist. And then if you're like, oh, I've already used the Nerdist promo code. Use the Feeb promo code. <laughs> you can do that too. F E A B kids. But look, no, see, this is my actual Audible app. I'm showing Chris my actual Audible app. I got a bunch of John Ronson's books on yep, here. I find yep. him delightful He's to listen great. to. And uh, and uh, Jonathan Little's exciting, uh, uh, excelling at No Limit Hold'em, which is 19. It's like a bunch of different authors. It's it's fascinating. Just some fun stories, you know, strategies, things like that. I'm here to plug a book for some reason. That's very nice of you. I hope Jonathan Little cuts you in on... I don't think he will. Doesn't know who I am. Doesn't care who I am. He's busy. Now he should plug He's busy the on the podcast circuit. or talk, talk salad and scrambled eggs. Oh, someone should record those. I haven't recorded one since March on either of those. <laughs> you must be out of Frasier episodes. No, we're not out of Frasier episodes. We've stopped like halfway through the second season. It's just like Kevin then went off to with yoga hosers. He's like in a different city all the time. Showing the movie and then like I my no schedule's matter, been a little be over the place. The Frasier, and it's, and it no. did, but our scheduling is and a lot of people ask all the time, is it done? The answer is no. Well, our just our schedules are kind I of hear a the mess blues right are calling. Now. Toss it out on scramble eight. Here's the nurse podcast number eight twenty one. Seth Rogan. Now entering nerdist.com. Everything feeds into Chris's geeko system. <laughs> oh, where am I? Where's my? Uh, oh, there's our space. A little our space. Uh, oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. This is awesome. This is what my office looks like at home. Oh, it is. I have a lot of toys and shit like that. What? What kind of toys? I'm kind of actually really into like Japanese vinyl toys. Like uh, I really like like. Like cause and run English and mm -hmm. uh, those guys. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I have a lot of and and but it all started with like superhero toys. And so. Well, we're going we're going to Japan uh, for the honeymoon in oh. a week and a half. So I need I need to know where to go. I toys. went to the Medicom toy like uh, headquarters, like their main office in Japan when I was there, and it was like blue because I collect like uh, like Bear bricks and Kubricks mm -hmm. and shit like that, which Medicom makes, and yeah, it was incredible. It was like the coolest place I've ever been. Oh, that's amazing! Yeah, it's the whole process. Yeah, it was really amazing. And I talked to the weird guy who owns Medicom who was like wearing like a, he was like what he was like a character out of like a Zoolander bit. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. Zoolander one or two. It kind of I don't know, somewhere in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> but I would imagine they I don't know if I don't know if I could get the 
I'd have to call and be like, I'm on a couple cable shows. In I America. did, yeah. I, I can't remember. I think I think you could do it. I think you could do it. You don't know. You can get in there. I don't think I'm on anything. You don't know. I think at try. the very least, your wife could probably get in there. <laughs> oh, <maybe. laughs> almost wife. The yeah. almost wife. Well, by the time you go to Japan, by the time I go to Japan, she will be the. She'll, she'll be, be like, the new hi, wife. I'm Mrs. Hurst. And yeah. That does help. I'm a Mrs. Hurst. Yes. That's yes. Okay. I'm fine with that. By the way, it's clear. Listen, I love my dad. But Hardwick is a terrible last name. It is. I mean, I don't really. I mean, they're both very, like, hoity names. I have a good friend who believes in name Darwinism, and just whoever, whichever member of the couple has the better last name, you both (laughs) take it. You take that, yeah. So I could be, maybe I could, maybe I could reverse hyphen out. I'd be Chris Hardwick Hurst. Yeah, that would be good. That would be fine. My wife's last name is Miller, and Seth Miller is a cooler name than Seth Rogen. Yeah, it's a way better. cool comic book artist. Seth Miller. Yeah, it totally does. I guess because of Frank Miller. Because of Frank Miller, yeah. I guess I basically. I just made yeah. that connection. Miller just is a good last name. <laughs> Seth Miller does sound like a. Uh, he does sound like a cool. I, I'm going to say like a DC character. Yeah, sounds like a cool DC character. Like an probably, alias. Yeah, yeah, like an alias. He's a young scientist kid, and yeah. then in his spare time, he's a robot hand. Yeah, he's a robot hand. <laughs> Maybe no other real superpowers. Yeah, just a robot hand. <laughs> also, also sounds like he'd be into improv. He could be yeah, into exactly. improv. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Seth makes him. Yeah, he's he quick could, on his feet. He, Stop he, using your he, robot that. hand in every yeah, scene. That's his. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. What was that? That's his alter ego. Is he's an improv teacher. His, 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 he's his, known for being able to adapt to any situation. His, his robot hand is a literal and a comedy crutch. Yeah, like exactly. It's the, same, it's like the same thing on both sides. Did you do Did you do improv for a while? I did. I was on uh, my high school improv team. Uh, and it's funny, I went to high school with Nathan Fielder. We were on the improv oh, yeah. team together. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, that's crazy. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I was on, yeah, we were on a, a high school improv team. And we were pretty good, actually. Uh, we would like compete. Yeah, as far as <laughs> I've high never, school improv I've teams never go. heard anyone describe their high school improv team and then go we were pretty good we actually were pretty good (laughs) like several members of the team have gone on uh jesse crookshank was on the team she's like a host for like e like uh and on empty like almost like half of the half of the people on the team went on to like actually get careers in show business like again yeah fielder was on the team um another guy ryan smith who works in uh like canadian film and television like a lot of the members of the team went on to like work in movies it's because of canada that's why i mean i know there was i know there i remember when i remember in high school people what was big was like oh i'm in um, theater sports would you yeah would you theater well theater sports was from vancouver Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, like uh, like yeah. theater sports as like a thing, like the like the I think I think like the company theaters like like as the organized like tournament of improv originated. Just like on Star Trek when Chekhov would claim everything was a Russian. Yeah, invention. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all from Vancouver. Hey, Chekhov you know, it's actually a Canadian. Yeah, DeForest <laughs> Kelly was from Vancouver. Actually. <laughs> Why? I, I kind of wonder. I, I kind of wonder what it is about the Canadian DNA that is so. I mean, that there's they like indoor stuff. Mm-hmm. They do like cold. indoor stuff, but the dryness of the humor. I mean, yeah. it's it's almost like it's almost like they took the British dry humor yeah. and then let it dry some more. Exactly, and yeah. then it became. Yeah, they took it and froze it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we really grow up with like inundated by British comedy. You know, like it's on Mr. Bean and mm-hmm. Faulty Towers and. Like Monty Python is just like on a lot when you're growing up in Canada, and I really think that's something to do with it. And I think, like, I always look at our stuff and I'm like, why is it so weird? And I think it's because we grow up watching Kids in the Hall, yeah, like inundated yeah. by it. Like, I like everyone I work with has seen every episode of Kids in the Hall, like, and everyone I grew up with has seen every episode of Kids in the Hall, like for the most part, you know, because it was on every single night. And so I think you're like inundated by like weird. Comedy, yeah. I think Kids in the Hall was a more cohesive version of Python. It was kind of like the Canadian version of it. It was, but, like, but it was so it was very stre- where I feel, I feel like Python was very much like we're just doing kind of weird shit for the sake of weird shit. And yeah, they're obviously all brilliant and they yeah. speak. They're polymaths and they they do their sketches in German and yeah, but they always end <laughs> kind of weird. And I feel like Kids in the Hall really did have like more of a sketch show structure to yeah, it. Yeah, for sure, one hundred percent. And they and I actually think that's why like. Canadians do well in American comedy because I think it is like a more accessible version of a type of comedy that is not American. So it does feel a little different. 
Like when I started working, uh, one of the first jobs me and Evan had was on the Ali G show. And Sasha, we found, just like didn't know a lot of American cultural stuff. Like he know what like spring break was. Mm -hmm. And like we did, and we didn't have it like the same way we did and they do here. But like we grew up like with all the same with MTV and shit like that. And so you'd see like so they'd go to spring break and stuff like that. And so we knew about all of America's stuff. We just didn't really view it as our stuff. <laughs> and so I think it puts Canadians in like a very unique situation to comment on American culture because they – have it and right. they're like a part of it but it's not like they're like one notch removed from it in right. some ways you know what I mean um, I and I've seen also- it like play out like I just saw that firsthand with Sasha I was like oh like we're the bridge between America <laughs> and Britain <laughs> as the writers of you know for Ali G at this moment you know uh, it was it was interesting you're also <laughs> like digesting like the most pure form of it like you're mm-hmm. not you're not experiencing what a real spring break is like you're experiencing MTV's yes exactly <laughs> The only culturalized <laughs> right. version of it. Yeah, God, I, I think I, I mean. I Whereas think, Chris experienced MTV's spring break. I did. I, you were I, really there. <laughs> I, I went to like four of them. That's crazy. And they were. Were you just getting laid left and right, bro? Well, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Brian no. McFadden was, though. <laughs> what was really funny about, about, being un- about being unsingled out is for some reason, I, I just didn't. I was not sticky on that show to the extent that I was in a bar one time yeah. and this girl came up to the guy standing next to me and goes, didn't I just see you as a contestant on Single Out oh, last night? Amazing. I was standing next to the guy. She never even noticed me. That's incredible. So, yeah, Contestants no. made a bigger impression on the show than, well, than, than you did. And you also have to understand that I had just come out of college and I was still – uh, not so uh, very socially inept yeah. in a way, mm-hmm. and not you know as much as MTV like scruffed me up and kind of made me look '90s, and my <laughs> hair was really long, and I had gas station attendant pants. And, <laughs> like I was still a nerdy kid that didn't know how to talk to these types of people yeah. comfortably, and I secret and I I really kind of hated them. Yeah, and so I just didn't you know I didn't like it. And so I just was never comfortable around it. So you'd go in and you'd shoot, and then MTV, because they were cheap, would literally try to fly you out the same day Whoa. that you worked, if they could. From might, spring break. Yeah, you might stay one night, but then they would they would fly you out. But I, I just don't – I don't have any good – I almost got to go to one because in – I was a writer for Undeclared, so it must have been like 2000 or 2001. It was probably one of the last big MTV spring breaks mm-hmm. that was happening, and David Crumholtz was <laughs> on some show or something, and to promote it, he was on Say What Karaoke it, <laughs> out of MTV spring break, and he invited me to go as his guest, and, and I literally remember going to Judd. And we were writing at the time on the show, and we were, like, gearing up to shoot or something. I was like, can I go, like, take Friday off and go to MTV Spring Break? He was like, fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the yeah. only opportunity. And that was it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, John Apatow has really <laughs> fucked you repeatedly. <laughs> Can't believe it. No, it was and, – and what's funny is if now one of my, like, 20-year-old employees came up to me and was like, yo, can I go to Spring Break? I'd be like, fuck no. No. <laughs> <laughs> no you got it right. Are you kidding me? Undeclared was a fun show. My uh, friend Jared Grody was on that show. Yeah, man, Jared Grody. Wasn't Charlie Hunnam on that? Charlie Hunnam was on it, and Jay Baruchel. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. It, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. It was weird because I was like a college age guy who was writing and acting on a college TV show, but I had not gone to college. So I would go visit my <laughs> friends in college a lot and try to do like intensive kind of research expeditions, which essentially amounted to just getting like super messed up for like several <laughs> days on end. Um, but I had a really good time. It was fun. It felt like college to me. Like that was kind of my college experience. I remember Maybe Jared would talk about that. Jared is a fucking great writer. He's amazing, yeah. I mean, he We is, let him improvise like every single thing he ever said on that show. He's such a yeah. phenomenal... He, t- he had one bit about like people who buy people who buy Britney Spears albums are people who are like money is too heavy to have a lot. Of. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> like he would just write those kind of weird sort of surreal jokes. And amazing and, jokes. And he would always talk about this British guy on Undeclared yeah. who was really he was like I don't know he's just. 
he's just not he doesn't seem that fun and he would come he would go up to Jared and Jared and be like I'm told you're funny but I don't see it you know like just like that kind of stuff and then ultimately that became that turned out to be Charlie Hunnam yeah he and he had an amazing career in drama (laughs) (laughs) he he went on to have an incredible dramatic acting career (laughs) that's a pretty spectacular writing job I mean just to be 20 yeah and be writing on a show, yeah. and I mean, how, I don't how I how, was even I might have been eighteen. Like it was in two thousand, two thousand one. Because you I didn't was, write on yeah. Freaks and Geeks. So I was eighteen you? and nineteen. No, I didn't. I would try. I would actually like write scenes and give them to Judd and the writers, and and I think that's why they maybe started letting us like improvise some of the scenes more. But I would I would try, and 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 maybe if it went on for a second season, I would have got in there. So and I would just go hang out in the writers room. I'd literally just like sit there and. Till they and they wouldn't kick me out, generally speaking. <laughs> but I wanted to be a writer so badly, and I'd written super like a version of Super Bad at that point already. And so I like really wanted to get. I, mo- I wanted to be a writer more than an actor, and so uh, yeah, I would try. And then that's why when Undeclared came along after Freaks and Geeks was canceled, I was first hired as a writer, and was actually specifically told like they don't want any of the cast members from Freaks and Geeks on it. And I was like, okay, I'll just write for the show, and then. Slowly, I like worked my way in there. <laughs> What's so- funny is I wrote the audition scenes, and so I literally would write scenes that were specifically tailored to make myself look good <laughs> as, as I was reading Very with other cool actors. Yeah. <laughs> if you met someone who didn't know you, uh, what would you say you do? Uh, I'd probably say I'm a writer. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. probably would. Takes up, I think it would take up the most majority of your time, right? Is right. Uh, uh, yeah, and it's probably the thing that I'm like the most comfortable with yeah. being out of all the yeah. things that really? I. Yeah, I mean, director just sounds kind of like poncy, and I don't like. I don't know why it just does. Like they're just like, oh, I'm a director. I don't know why it doesn't sound good yeah. for some reason. Producer, no one knows what the. No one knows what that is. <laughs> so, like, that's that's a vague job. I'm an actor. I, yeah, I, it just, again, it sounds, it's kind of like, it's not, it's a douchey, I, I don't know. I, I just, like, <laughs> I'm embarrassed wrong? to be an actor. Like, it's embarrassing <laughs> to be an actor. Is like, being an actor is an embarrassing job. Like, it's an embarrassing job. <laughs> is it, it's sometimes it's just a function of... Oh, I'll just do it. I know sometimes. what needs to, I know how it needs to be done. I'll just do it. Sometimes, I, yeah. sometimes I I just know as a as a writer that I as the actor would be the best person to do it. You know, and not just just out of specificity's sake, not out of any skill sake or anything like that. It's just like oh, for specific reasons, I think that. And and I think I've actually gotten a lot better at acting. Honestly, like I I was much less comfortable with it when I was younger. Like. It was something that I kind of fell into, honestly. Like I, 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 I didn't think I was going to be like an actor. I thought I was going to be like a writer and maybe a director. And, um, but yeah. And so I, I was very. I was. I think I was fortunately like one of those people who got to learn how to act on television. <laughs> like <laughs> before your very eyes, I became a better actor. <laughs> and by the end of Undeclared, I'm like a, a, a I'm like a serviceable actor. <laughs> it's just that you you and Evan do these things that I they're, they're the kind of things that I think you would talk about with your friends. And I was like, oh, it'd be really great if a bunch of actors just played themselves in yeah. an apocalypse movie. Uh-huh. But then you guys just get to make that. Yeah, and then we just do it. I mean, and it takes a long time. We don't just get to do. No. No, 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 like it takes years and years and years, and honestly, the weirder the idea, the longer it takes to make. But yeah, when I look at the stuff that, I mean, not all, you know, again to varying degrees, but like my favorite stuff that we've done, like I'm almost as more time goes by, I'm more shocked that we were able to do it. Like, like I think like as I'm more distanced from this is the end. As an example, I look at it, and I'm like, wow, that's like a really weird movie. <laughs> <laughs> to have gotten to exist even in the world, like, it exists. Really but strange. you guys got a haunted house at Universal. Yeah, we which got it. So yeah, weird, which is amazing. Yeah, and that was all because of Franco. I, that all like somehow came from a James Franco email, where it's like, I think I know a guy who could get us a haunted house. I was like, <laughs> go for it, man! Like, run, I was, I was, run, 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 run with I had that, a free dude. weekend, yeah. so I built a haunted exactly. house. That's basically, we were, what happened? I, yeah, we were wa- we were walking through the house. We were that haunted house with Brian Husky. Wondering if he had made it into the thing. Was like, he in it? No. I never went. That's so funny. I, I was out of town the whole time it was open, but I really wanted to the go. The commitment level of Channing Tatum on a leash was un. 
unbelievable. It was. I actually recently, uh, I found the the actual email that I wrote to Channing Tatum to <laughs> ask him to do the movie. And, uh, and it was shockingly, like, up front. It was like, I did not sugarcoat it at all. It was almost like a tech, it was, it was like the most, like, technical, like, here's what the film is about. We have actors stuck in our house. The apocalypse happens. Daddy McBride gets kicked out. He makes a cannibal gang. He has a sexual <laughs> gimp on the end of a leash. We thought it would be funny if you were that gimp, in all reality, it'll be you on your hands and knees for probably two nights in New Orleans. Like, it, like you will literally see your face for maybe two seconds, and like we're like we think it'll be really funny, and th- and that's all I can ask. And like within like an hour, we got a response. It was like, yes, I will do it. That's Just awesome. like, it's like send me the dates, and we'll figure it. He's out. a remarkably cool guy. Oh, he's incredible. Yeah, it was absolutely amazing. It was one of the most like impressive acting things I've ever seen. Because also, he's wearing a mask for almost all of it. Like it. Did didn't have to be him. We could, like, 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 we could get you a stunt guy or something. He's like, no, nah, I got this. Like, it was so crazy. It was like completely. It was. It was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my entire life. I've never seen a level of commitment that deep. Well, and yeah. you said I think you. You, did you say it took five years to get Sausage Party made? It took like, I mean, it took us several years to write it. But yeah, there was probably like, uh, there was probably like a solid, there was probably took three years to write it and then like a solid three years of just trying to get someone to make it. Like, just going every meeting, every, like we go to every studio, every producer, so, you know, new people crop up like, oh, they have access to some dude with money. They'll, you know, maybe they can do it. And we did that for years and years and years. And just nobody, everyone loved it and thought it was great and funny. But like no one wanted to be the first to make an R-rated animated movie, basically, which was crazy to us. But also made a lot of sense. <laughs> and so we... It's crazy how much sense this Yeah, makes. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a right brain, left brain conundrum. Well, they like, that, it's, it's a very... Like, they, they did similar stuff in the 70s. Yeah. You know, like, they would do R-rated comedy... Yeah. Or R-rated animated films. Yeah, like Heavy Metal. Heavy Metal or... Like, uh, or uh, any of that, like, but I think those were very fringe. fringe yeah, and part of our whole idea was like this shouldn't be like a fringe movie. Like we want this to be like a big mainstream like comedy. Like hopefully this will appeal to everyone who likes comedy. You know, um, and again, and, and also what was so weird is because like TV adult animation is so popular with like The Simpsons and Family Guy and South Park and stuff. Like almost the most popular popular animation yeah. on TV is for adults, and so. It was really, again, it was one of those things, like, Evan, thank God we did it. Evan was like, we should wear hot dog suits to the pitches. Because, like, <laughs> he's like, I'm sure a bidding war is going to happen. It'll be very competitive. Like, what better way to show our confidence than to roll it in hot dog suits? And, like, we didn't, thank God. Because, like, before we were, like, even, like, to our cars, we would get the phone call being like, they loved it. They're not making it. And I was like, and I, I kept trying to Evan to be like, if we were in hot dog suits You're right so now, sad. this would be the worst. Day. Like, this is already not the greatest day of my life but if we were in hot dog suits that would just have compounded this so much more um and then uh megan ellison who has a company called annapurna um who made zero dark 30 and the master and american hustle and um a lot of very fancy movies by all means uh we met with her and she loved the script and we just really got along and she's like i'm gonna I'm going to try to make this movie. And then once she got involved, then Amy Pascal, who was at Sony at the time, was like, okay, this kind of mitigates our risk enough to the degree that (laughs) it becomes something that we are willing to do. Um, And we got a company called Nitrogen, uh, which is an animation studio based out of Vancouver, which is where we're from, which was a nice coincidence. Um, And they animated that Canadian credit. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, for us, it's it's cool, though. Yeah. (laughs) We can't be accused of taking drugs. Jobs out of America. No, but also, but also like the, the, you know, those the Canadian film board. There's a very nice so many, incentive. The yeah. Canadian film board had so made so many great animated shorts. Yeah, the so, Log Riders Waltz or whatever it was called was one. There was this cat the, came, the back cat came back. Yeah, yeah, the cat came, the cat back, came back, back one was amazing. I still watch the cat came back. Oh, it was amazing. Yeah, stunning. Oh yeah, those things we grew up. I was on television all the time. Like I've watched that cat came back thing so Cordell many times. Parker. It was Cordell it's Barker. Insane. That's amazing. And yeah. I think I think Bill Plimpton did some of them. Uh, that were yeah. on in Canadian television a lot. But um, this Log Riders Waltz 
one. If you haven't seen it, you should look at it. It's the most like decidedly Canadian thing you will ever see in your entire <laughs> more life. than the Red Green Show. It's like yes, it, it's like it's like it, it's it's of a similar tone, I would say, it, but it's like mainlining Canadiana into your. <laughs> uh, so but, if it takes if it's taking you three years, so it's three years to write the script. What's because obviously you're doing other things at the same time. So yeah. is that just? Every once in a while, you and Evan are popping jokes back and forth, no. and you sit down. How does what is happens in that three years? It took us a long time to really. There's like a long like marination phase that happens with I think some of our more out there ideas. Like we don't rush into it because you know, like with this is the end. It was similar where like it took us a long time to go from like, oh, it'd be funny, a bunch of actors playing themselves in a house during the apocalypse to like an actual movie that is like worthy of its own existence in a 90 minute format you know what I mean? And and Sausage Party was exactly the same we're like, yeah, a bunch of food in a grocery store afraid of getting eaten, that's like you know, how do you turn that into an idea that actually, hopefully like you know, supports itself for 90 minutes and has like deeper ideas behind it and is actually like unpredictable and takes different turns that than you expect and evolves and changes throughout itself like those are the things we want our movies to do and 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 it sometimes just takes years and years to think of the ideas that allow us to do that you know and it's like a slow compilation process and the actual writing of the script often is like takes the least amount of time out of anything like once we have wrapped our heads around, like, with this at the end, it took us years to think of, like, oh, they realize they can get sucked up into heaven still. Right. Like, that, like, simple thing was, like, like an idea that took us, like, two years to come up with. <laughs> Just of, like, what happens? Like, where does it go? What's the evolution? Like, what shape does it start to take? And there's several ideas in Sausage Party that... You know, I won't ruin because they're very unpredictable twists throughout it, I hope, but that literally just took us years to come up with. Like, oh, this is what the movie could actually be about, you know? Um, and then, yeah, and then writing the scripts takes, like, like probably one out of that three-year process. It's such basically. a long process. It, yeah. you, it's, with something, something like Sausage Party, which part of the sell of it is that no one else has really done it, mm -hmm. are you worried in that amount at length of time, like someone's going to fucking do it. Someone else yeah. is going to, and they're like, right as we get to the finish line, it's, you know, for sure. Yes. That always happens <laughs> um, with almost all of our movies. And almost every time there is some other movie that actually is looming, that kind of ultimately turns out to be completely different. And we feel stupid forever having worried about <laughs> it. But what's funny is like we were making pineapple express. There's this movie called without a paddle. Yes. Um, that has Zach Shepard and Seth yeah, Green. And Seth yeah. Green is in it. And, and, and it's kind of about guys on the run from weed dealers because they burned down their weed field. And I remember it came out, we heard it was getting made while we were working on Pineapple Express. And we were like, oh no, like this is going to ruin our fucking movie. And then we saw it and we were like, oh, this could not be more different <laughs> from our movie. And um, yeah, we were very afraid that someone specifically the South Park guys, most of <laughs> them, right. most of all would make some sort of R rated fully CG. And, and there was like rumblings of other ones that have kind of come and gone in the last few years, but none of them came into being, but there I, think, were, I don't know if it interests them. They already did R rated puppets. So I think they're, they're good. Yeah, Try exactly. Like, I, yeah, I, I yeah, hope we're so. fine. Yeah. We're fine. And I think they'll never do puppets again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, was it was really hard. <laughs> really, really, really hard. Yeah. <laughs> really hard to do, to do, uh, R rated puppets. Yeah. The DP who shot preacher shot team America and he had amazing stories. <laughs> <laughs> Incredibly difficult. It was, <laughs> um, the preacher, by the way, was, uh, I mean, I know I look, <laughs> hey, 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah. That you say gotta this, say. But I really did love the show. <laughs> Thank I mean, you. It's, it's well, so... you sound a lot like someone with a three-year overall deal. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you have no best at stake. Yeah. What's funny though is it is it, it be, you know I, I get I do get that from you like well yeah because you know you get fired if you go like I don't that's not the relationship no, that's not true I have at all. With yeah. Contract yeah. signed, bro. He can say whatever he yeah, wants. Exactly. Not... You could just avoid it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I could not say anything about it, but yeah, I think. You know, if people can, uh, I'm so I'm so excited to see the second season of that show. Yeah, me too. So much happened in the first. There was so much to cram into the first season. Yeah, that I think for people who had trouble following some of the stuff, if they if they appreciate it and then get because it, it, now it feels like oh now the story is actually going to yeah. start. Yeah, I think it's like built on so many crazy ideas that if you're not a comic book fan are like 
very abstract ideas for an hour-long dramatic te- character-based television show, you right. know? And and that was our thought was like we should not assume that like these types of ideas are like easily digestible by a lot of people and like a lot of people actually like these types of ideas could actually be very alienating if you just lay them out and dump them out and don't kind of tease them or build them, you know, um, or establish like an emotional reality in the characters that you're invested in before you unload this like crazier subject matter, you know? And that was really our thought was like, how do you kind of explain all these crazy ideas and get people emotionally invested in it? So by the time the season's over, you're kind of, where the comic starts, which is they're kind of out in the world and on the road, basically. How are you focusing on, like, what I, I'm just, I think you might be that, like, I don't know how much weed you smoke, but <laughs> I think you might be, I used to say, like, Kevin Smith and Doug Benson were two of the most productive stoners I've They met, are very productive. But you're very productive. Mm-hmm. So how are you... I was just with Ricky Williams this morning. He's one, well, of, there you he's go. one of the more productive stoners also. <laughs> how are you balancing out your calendar? Is it like, okay, so Preacher is, you know, January to March, and then from a- April to this time, we're focusing on this movie, and then we're doing... It yeah. always feels like there's something in motion. Uh-huh, it's different. And I bounce back and forth between things a lot. Like, there was... You know, several months where, like, I would be going from, like, the preacher editing room to, like, our production offices for the pilot we were gearing up to shoot to, like, the other editing room for the movie we had in post, you know? And I'd literally spend, like, three hours in each place throughout the day, and they were all in Hollywood, so I just would drive around. And that's how it is sometimes, or sometimes we'll schedule it out and be like, okay, we're making a movie from these months, and then as we're in post on it, we can prep this thing, and then maybe, you know, it's all very, like organically comes together we have very little strategy in our careers we probably should have more but we we it it really we kind of take it as it comes because also you never know what's actually going to happen right movies and tv shows and everything like until you're like two weeks into filming it i don't actually think it's real like 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 not even people are like the first day. I'm like no, give, us, give us a few weeks. Yeah. <laughs> and then once they've spent like a, a, once you have to get past like the terminal velocity of spending in order to make it that you were not coming back. And in the first few weeks, they can still shut you down. It might be worth the money to them. And so we've had that happen almost like enough times that yeah, like we really don't count on anything happening until it's actually happening. So that's why we have a thousand things we're always trying to do at once because you don't know which one's actually going to happen right. ever, you know? Like, of all the things we have in development right now, like, I could not tell you which one is actually going to be the next one that materializes because you just never know. How do you not get overwhelmed? Um, You must have those moments where you're like, I think yeah. my brain is going to just split the seams on It my actually, screen. like, the only thing... I get most stressed out around the releases of our movies. That's the only thing that, like, at this point, I, I, because it's so, it's just it's like just such so like a, I have no control over it, and I think that's why it stresses me out. Everything else, I have a lot of control over. Our work, I have a lot of control over. My schedule, I have quite a bit of control over. Like the only, you know, one of the biggest things I have no control over is just like. Will people like our movies, and will they make enough money that they keep letting us make movies? Right, right, Which right. are my two main concerns when it comes to the release of our movies, and and so literally in like the two weeks leading up to the release of our movies are really the only times that I'm like, and then I'm doing a lot of promotion, which is this is not that stressful, but you know, going on talk shows sometimes is stressful, and like just the tra- six minutes be funny, yeah, exactly. And the tra- I don't like traveling, so the travel is stressful and. Going going all around just stresses me out, you know? And so those are the only times that I really start to get stressed out. But, uh, yeah, in my day-to-day, being busy doesn't stress me out. Like, I, I, I like it. Like, um, and if I like the things I'm working on, then then it's fun, and I actually just really enjoy it. You know? Is there an idea that you love so much that you haven't been able to push through somewhere? Um... What's crazy is kind of Sausage Party and Preacher were like the last two of those Uh in a lot of ways, which is – we're definitely in kind of a different – like there is like a – it kind of feels like we've hit the end of the line in some regards as like the things – the old things we'd been working on, you know? Like those are the last – and they're both things we've been trying to make for like 10 years basically. So 
and it's weird because I've been promoting both of them, and they're, they could not be more <laughs> <laughs> different from one another. And so many days, like at Comic Con, it was like Sausage Party one day, preach the next day, and I was at South by Southwest. It was Sausage Party one day, preach the next day, and like it's it, and it's fun to talk about both of them. I love both of them, and they both are very like representative of like where my tastes and sensibilities lie, you know. Um, but it is funny that those are the two things that I've been talking about a lot lately. But there isn't really anything. No, I mean, we have a lot of other things. Things are slowly becoming those things as, <laughs> as no one makes them. So in around three or four years, yes, there, there will be those things that that we can't get made and that we've been I trying just, to get made for years. Like, there right must, now they're still new. There must be like – uh, there must be like a library of Alexandria under Hollywood somewhere of amazing things that just yeah. for whatever political reasons yeah. got got suppressed or didn't make it out. I mean, I, I don't know how how you would ever yeah. find out, but there must be such. I'm amazed at stuff. how many like great pilots there must be, like that they made, that tons of money. Like that's what's so weird. Like now that we're doing more television, is like as you're shooting a pilot, you're like, no one might ever see this. Like, a movie, yeah. the worst movies people can watch, right. you know? Like, even, like, the greatest pieces of shit of all time don't get locked away into a vault where no one can see them. And they're, like, great pilots that no one will ever see. Ever, that's, that's why I like you know? the way Amazon does it. If they pay for it, they air them, and yeah. you get a chance to be like, oh, I like this one. Make more That's bosh. how we got Danger and Eggs picked up. See? Yeah. Is it, is it, it, it people, you know, we were able to drive enough traffic to it, and... They were like, okay, now do, you know, 20 yeah. of them or whatever. Yeah, that's amazing. Which yeah. is, Whereas, like and also the Netflix way, which is just like, we're not going to give you a pilot. Here's a Here's quadrillion dollars. Yeah. <laughs> we're also not going to tell you how many people are watching. Because it, it exactly. doesn't matter. People subscribe. That's Who cares? The that's the dream scenario in some ways, where like you don't know if you're successful or not. Because then you're as successful you as you are, in, as you are in your own head, <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is fantastic. I know, but it's so hard to measure. It's like we don't have – Stop thinking business. of it like that. Yeah. But it's, it's gone. But, but how do you know – you know, like how do you – how if can the you If checks growth? keep coming, you're fine. Exactly. That's it. <laughs> oh, that's such a reductionist way to think about it. That's think it. That's... Netflix doesn't give a shit. They have like a billion subscribers. It's not that many, but it's – you know, they right. have money upon money. Yeah. That's why they just said at TCAs, everyone's worried about us, spe- us outspending everyone. Well, we're going to like triple how much money we're spending. Well, they, <laughs> and, and, they don't care because they're is. still getting money. But you know what, though? It, it's – and it's, but it's not even just a money thing. It's I just, subscribe to watch Frasier. <laughs> I don't subscribe for Orange is the New Black. Do you, but if my money pays on, for yeah, Orange yeah, is the New Black, that's fine. Don't it's you fine. have all Frasier on DVD? And it's democratic. Every, the, the DVD is my emergency in case something goes wrong with the <laughs> internet. internet goes out. Yeah, 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 you never know. <laughs> but, 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 just, but also the, the, the quality of the stuff they're making. Like, just because people have money doesn't mean the quality is going to be good. But, you know. They're making good stuff. Yeah. They're making real Great good stuff. stuff. Yeah, no, T- I mean, we're consciously doing more television because, like, TV's great right now. And, like, with Preacher is a good example of, like, that we would never get those resources to do something that weird in movies. And they right. probably wouldn't even have let me and Evan do it if it was right. a movie, honestly. Right. They would have been like, get someone who's done this before. Mm-hmm. Like, in TV, just the fact that we were, like, movie people was, like, flashy enough that we were allowed to try something that was, like, completely unlike anything we'd ever done, which... Honestly, yeah, like if we had wrote a movie like Preacher that had the proportional bu- budget of Preacher from movies to television, no one would have ever let us. Who make did it. you say was going to do it and then you had pitched yourself as our face to Sam Mendes. Sam Mendes yeah. was going to do it. Like exactly, movie. that's who would do the movie version of right. Preacher and we kept trying to do it and that's why we kept getting overpassed. But when it went to television, Maybe we were, you know, just I think we were like really just in the right place at the right time because we were like the movie people who wanted to do it. But that would have been a tough movie to do because you have to. How do you set up? I guess you you can't really, really set it up if it's a movie. You kind of just have to do it. it. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's just I would imagine there was movie scripts. I never read any of them, but I think great writers wrote scripts for the movie you right. know um i think john august wrote one of the oh, wow. scripts yeah. yeah john's great yeah amazing and so um now that we've done this i was always afraid to read it because i was afraid i would subconsciously steal from it but maybe sure. now that the season's over i i will read it because i'm i'm just kind of curious as to what, to what yeah i was kind of fascinated uh by it but um but yeah it, it's like tv is letting us do things so far knock on wood that like would be very hard to do in movies the uh, uh, I was it was funny to see how many people 
when Ian Coletti was on the after show, they're like, oh my gosh, he's so adorable. Like, yeah, everyone, he's a good looking yeah, he's, he's an actor. A, he doesn't really have a butthole for a mouth. <laughs> but in the comics, he our... doesn't really have a butthole. <laughs> there wasn't an open casting. Yeah. If he did, it would have made his life a lot We're easier in some ways. Yeah. Type, <laughs> like a butthole type. Like a butthole type. Less time in the makeup chair. Yeah, but because <laughs> in the comics, he's, he's, he's <laughs> super fucked up. Way grosser. Yeah, we toned him down for the show to make him not as... Uh, there is an image online, and I don't know if it's from the HBO. There was an HBO pilot that almost got made one time, and I, I think it didn't get made. But there is some image online, maybe just an effects house did it. You know, they just do these things sometimes, like, of... Like what our space looks like exactly from the comics, like done on someone in prosthetic, and it's like it's it's so hard to look at. Oh yeah, that I remember we looked at that and we were like, this is the proof that we should not <laughs> try to replicate the exact look from the comic. It's just it's just too much. <laughs> yeah, someone did that. I think they did that with Simpsons. Uh, panels where they did like this is what they would look like in real if they were real. Oh, that's so amazing! And it was it's really disturbing. Oh, I got to see legitimately, that. Legitimately, it's legitimately disturbing. That sounds amazing. Uh, I think it's great that the guy who played Kelly in Bad News Bears is now one of the best actors. Yeah, in the world, Jackie's amazing. And he's really, I was like, I'm always intimidated by actors. Like, as a director, I don't like dealing with actors, which is not a good quality to have. <laughs> I just don't like, that's why I think I work with my friends a lot, because I'm, I'm just intimidated by actors sometimes. And so, with my friends, I'm more comfortable with them. Uh, but Jack or Haley was someone I was very intimidated by, because I was like, oh, I have to direct him now. And he's like a real actor. He's like one nominated for Academy Awards and stuff like that. I was like, this is... Uh... And, and then he was so nice. He couldn't have been cooler or easier. And and he's made, like, the weirdest character ever. It's, like, the strangest dude of all time, which is great. Did it... <laughs> would you... Like, would, would you allow yourself to direct some crazy... Uh, you know, if they were like, we want you to do a Sony Pictures classic... Like an epic period, like would you direct like hard like a cast full of Academy Award winners? Yeah, like, I would. <laughs> I would not only in a movie I thought I could direct, you know, um, but because that's the other thing about good actors is they do make your job a lot easier and they make uh, they make you look good as a director as well, like. There's so many days, actually, where, like, you have a plan. Like, you go in every day of filming with, like, a little plan. You're like, oh, I want to shoot like this and this. And for this line, I'll get this shot. And there's, like, 30 shots I want to do throughout the day. And as soon as there's a performance problem, your plan is suddenly out the window. And it's like, oh, now we just have to shoot this scene in a simple way and focus on getting the performance right. And that happens to every actor. Like, I've caused that to happen on countless scenes that I've directed. So that's even more annoying. Um, but but with, you know, obviously the higher caliber actor and the more you as a director have done your job in talking to them beforehand, the less that happens and the more style you can actually inject into uh, your work as a director, I find, because you literally just have more time to do shots and stuff that make it look better. But I can't help but wonder if you're directing someone like Daniel Day Lewis who won't drop character. Yeah. Do you have to say like, uh, President Lincoln? Yeah, exactly. Could I think you, you do. <laughs> pick that up fast, and then maybe say like, can well, you? Well, that's what's weird is acting is very technical sometimes. Like sometimes it's literally like the camera can't see your face unless you look more that way. <laughs> Right. And like how? Yeah, I don't. So do you know. have to say, Mr. President? Can yeah, you can, this way Mr. Camera, our imaginary photo box <laughs> requires the light to bounce off your face in imagine, a certain way. Hanging out with Daniel Day Lewis yeah. while he's filming is like going to a Ren Fair, where the yeah, guy exactly. where I won't drop it. It's just a it's semantical like, nightmare. Just yeah. how do you? do I just it? need a bathroom, <laughs> yeah. please. I just need a working bathroom. And how do I tell you you're not hitting your mark? Oh, I do too, my lady. I do too. Oh, what are these witchcraft words? No, it's so I've never. Never dealt with that thing. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> probably never will. <laughs> I'm sure Daniel Day Lewis will never work with me. He might. You know what though? He you might. Never you, know. you must. I, I, I would imagine. I would imagine people that you probably. I'm constantly surprised at who's willing to work with us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you guys make fun stuff, and I think there's this. I think there's also this kind of. Um, mythos that is developed around it of like oh you're all friends and you hang out and you just happen to make stuff and so there's a, there's almost like this bigger overarching meta relationship that I think people like 
feeling like they're a part of too. That's great. We all hate each other in real life, but it's nice <laughs> that we've. That I'm glad that the the illusion has upheld itself for as long as it has. Uh, no, we actually all very much get along, and it's and it is fun. And but the truth is, if I didn't like them, I would still want to work with them because I actually think they are the like the funniest, most talented people that are available to work with, generally speaking. And so. It's and, and and I met almost all of them through work. Um so it really isn't like, oh, I hire my friends. It's like, oh no, I've become friends with who I think are some of the most talented people who are making movies, you know, and I've just maintained those friendships and and I keep working with them mostly because I just they're so good at their jobs, you know. But I would imagine it also part of the reason why people probably like doing it is because it lets people like Emma Watson do something weird that she would never normally get to do yeah i hope those people view it that way <laughs> it's, it's my only hope that they come out of it feeling that i got to do something fun and not like what what the fuck just happened to me and i'm sure we've had an even split honestly um but sometimes it's funny because i had met michael fassbender a few times uh while we were filming this at the end we they were making 12 years a slave and we would hang out sometimes and and he, very similar movie and i think like dramatic actors like him he kept saying, like, oh, I want to make one of your types of movies, you know? And then when we were making the Steve Jobs movie, I was like, I bet you never thought we'd be working together on one of your types of movies. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you didn't think I'd be lowering your art form. I bet thought you'd be elevating my art form. Did um, you hang out with Waz? Uh, I did hang out with Waz quite a bit, actually. Seems like a super cool guy. Oh, he's like the nicest guy in the entire world and has, like, amazing stories. And I really got along with him. Like, we still email every once in a while. Uh, and he was nice enough to auction off some, like, charity lunches with me and him. Uh, so, I like, I, every once in a while I have a charity lunch that I oh, go have with him. So great. Which is great because I we, it's a good time to catch up. Nice enough to do that? Or yeah. did he just do it without telling you? No, yeah, I mean, oh, by the way, so no, I, I did it. I did it. <laughs> I bought. I bought on eBay. I bought a five-inch floppy that he signed. It just it's says. Amazing. It just says Waz yeah. on it. It's really amazing. Yeah, like it, he's one of of all the people I know. Like it's it's super weird that I know Steve Waz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's high on the list of like it's weird. Like people I could call. Like if I had to make a list of like how did it get to the place that I know how to call these people? Like Waz is very high on. You that. know, you have the to, guy who invented computers. Is you have to put him on speed dial just so it just has like it says Waz. Yeah, family and then Waz. I love Waz. You, you have. Did you ever meet him when you yeah. were? Yeah, yeah, I met him a couple times. He's like. The most lovable guy yeah. in the world, right? He's a weirdo. Yeah, he's an old, he's a old computer weirdo, an he's, old billionaire computer weirdo. Yeah, yeah. He's he great keeps stories. A, he keeps a, a pad of two two dollar bills. bills. Which cost him, he, he orders them and has them cut yeah. and turned into tearaway pads. That he signs for that people. That he signs for people. It's like, I went to the it mag- costs him more to make the pad than $2. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I went to the Magic Castle with Waz for six hours. <laughs> it was really did like. Did you guys see any shows? Or did you- yeah, he said we just saw, yeah, no, we saw every show. It was amazing. He loves magic. Shockingly. Shocking. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, why doesn't he buy? I mean, he could just buy the magic. Exactly, he probably he, could. He wanted to. But I don't yeah. know what it must be the responsibility. Well, I guess if you've been a billionaire for a long time, yeah, you you probably get over the idea of like you probably don't drive around and go, yeah, I could buy that. I guess I could buy that too. I could probably buy that. He likes a deal. I will say, like he was, he's excited about a cheap, I gotta say, a cheap restaurant. The super rich people I know love a deal. Yeah, they love a deal. Love a deal. Love a deal. He's into a deal. Yeah, we'll talk about deals. <laughs> yeah. I want to be like Waz. <laughs> Don't talk about deals. I'm like maybe one of the few people you can like maybe talk about that with, but like most people are not psyched to hear you talk about that. <laughs> Clip the coupon. Yeah, exactly. Oh, you got yeah, you got. 20 bucks off that. You know, I got a six inch (laughs) sub, but I just coupon. (laughs) Exactly. 12 inch. Literally. It's like two six inch subs. I got lunch for tomorrow. You have the economy of a small country. (laughs) It's just at your ATM. (laughs) Like, I personally have given you like (laughs) $500,000 just over the years. Like, you have my money. (laughs) You don't just have like figurative riches. Like, I've directly given you my money. (laughs) Like, a good amount of it over the the years. Did doing the Steve Jobs movie make you did, did you like just being an actor yes 
I really did. And honestly, because I was considering not acting anymore, like like in other people's movies. It's not so, it's not like that was it's not a hard decision to make because I don't get the opportunity to do it that often. It's not like I'm really not like it's not like I'm getting tons of offers that I'm rejecting. Like I don't get offered a lot of parts in other people's movies. And so part of me was thinking like maybe I should just like close the floodgate on that and just like only act in our movies and the ones I was making and then and then that came up, and I had a really good time doing it. And I thought, I will, you know what? I'll continue acting in other people's movies. And since then, I have not acted in anyone else's <laughs> movies because no one has offered me the opportunity to act in their movies. <laughs> so it was a purely symbolic decision. I think, I think most people see, you know, they see you or the, even like the, like Emma Watson or people that they, you know, they go, oh, those people are very successful at what they yeah. do. They could probably do anything. Yeah. And I think... What they don't realize is you can't. That the no. film the film business is actually quite restrictive. No, if I was just an actor and I didn't write and produce and direct, I would have been in like two movies in the last ten years. <laughs> like seriously, like I would not, I would not be at all successful. Like I, I would not. I'd probably need like three other jobs to support myself. Like it, yeah, I don't. It's it, and that's the reason we started. I mean, like. I knew very early in my career, like, I'm going to have to self-perpetuate my own work. Like, there's very few people being like, I need a, like, a chubby Jew in my movie. (laughs) Like, that's not how Hollywood works. People are like, we should put Brad Pitt in our movies. And I was like, oh, I'm going to have to make movies that need that type of role in order to function. They might say, we need a chubby Jewish guy to finance Exactly, yeah, not to be in them. (laughs) Wrong line of work. (laughs) So what are you working, are you working on... What I, I imagine you are you writing season two of Preacher? Currently? We're like just starting to talk about so it. So is there anything else that you're doing that's happening soon? Well, we have like a pilot uh, for FX that we're going to shoot um, that we're working on right now. We'll probably start – we're writing the script right now. We're working on the script. But we'll film that sometime in the next year basically. <laughs> and Is that announced? Um, I don't know if it is. I think it is. I don't know if it is. It's called. It's about singularity. It's uh-huh. about uh, Kurzweil. Art, yeah, it's about artificial intelligence. It's a, it's a half hour comedy about <laughs> about uh, the singularity, basically. Um, and I won't say anything else, just because I honestly don't even know if uh, we've. If, oh, if it's anyone happening! Talked I, just, I, just yeah, it's okay. article, I just read an article. about okay. neural dust. Yeah, exactly. It's oh, it's happening. It's super scary, and so we're trying to make a comedy out of it. Neural dust, basically, just like you know, just like small particles that work. You know, kind of like I, kind of like nanomites. Yeah, know, like yeah. They just sort of work in your system and can uh, wipe out whole civilizations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, it, it's you know they they always they always kind of pitch you the good stuff first. Oh, it can help your body, you know, yeah. with functions that maybe your body, if if you have problems with certain functions, it can help get in there. That could probably also probably wipe. Yeah, out. exactly. Also wipe out I, <laughs> wrote, I wrote a I wrote a prank for Spade's prank show. That's I think it might air next week. But where the guy we're pranking thinks he's responsible. for for the singularity started. Wow. That's and pretty the robot great. goes nuts and I starts can't. destroying everything. Oh, I can't wait for that. That's amazing. How does, how does one respond to such a... Yeah. You know what? Everyone, how did, he, did he take it well? Everyone <laughs> takes it well. Unless, it's funny, like all the people that we had that like casting would do... He took it pretty well. They, we they, it's funny because the show's called Fameless, so the point, the premise yeah. of the show is that it's like people that want to be famous for no discernible reason. They have no talent. They have no Perfect. nothing. They just want to be famous. So that's How do I get on the show? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it was interesting what we sort of figured out throughout the making of it was like if they had like any sort of like improv training or were doing stand-up or comedy it or anything, wasn't good. they weren't going to take it well. Yeah, yeah. Right. But if they just wanted to be famous, you know, they had, they had fun with it. Like that we did good. one – the one that aired on the season premiere, the one I wrote that was like sort of almost blew our budget was like uh, I had we had this girl come in to read the she was auditioning for to anchor the celebrity news on this internet news network and what happens is the apocalypse starts happening and she's the last broadcasting news station oh that's amazing and you were able to convince her of that uh huh wow no. that's incredible two people that's no. amazing <laughs> that's no. absolutely incredible yeah. They it, had to know that it, it was, was stunning. We had like that's just around the studio, we had different people 
station as like our reporters yeah. in like Nebraska, Florida, whatever. And then we'd have like this rolling fog would come in. And wow. that was, what like, kind of an apocalypse was it? It was an alien apocalypse. Whoa, cool. They had to make, we had to, n- network was like, make sure this doesn't look like terrorism so at all. So you said War of the Worlds? That's uh, incredible. Essentially, two, we did two a live people. War of the Worlds. <laughs> <laughs> two people. Like, we were going to do a third person, but the second girl like bought it so convincingly. Like, like at the end of it, the fog gets into the studio, and at the end of it, she's on the desk trying to stay away from the fog to like finish the news broadcast. <laughs> like, Whoa, good for was, her! It was stunning. It was. Uh, Ladies and really gentlemen, some startling reports are coming in. Through <laughs> <laughs> the news now. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's incredible. Do you ever want to go back to stand? You ever want to do stand up again? No. I don't know. Oh. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, Seth. <laughs> Seth, I've thought time, about. I, I don't know. First I, time I ever met Seth, he was doing stand up. Yeah. It's funny, Judd's been doing it a lot more lately. He has been, And he's been great. I saw him at Just for Laughs like two weeks ago, and it was incredible. Um, I don't know. Part of me thinks about it, and then part of me is like, what the fuck am I going to talk about? I don't know. I don't have anything to say. And, and And I'm so busy that I don't think... I like really respect it as a thing, and I don't want to like half-ass it. And I, I probably would just be half. And if it didn't go well, then you'd feel bad, and be like, "God damn it!" Now I just feel. Yeah, exactly. Now I just like have created a new situation to make myself feel <laughs> shitty in, which, which I don't. I'm need. feeling terrible. Let me call yeah, Wallace. See exactly. if he has any deals. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've created a whole new <laughs> circumstance to make myself oh, feel Seth, bad. Oh, I just went to Dick's Sporting Goods. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I clipped a thing from the paper. I got five baseballs for the price of three. Do you play baseball? No, but what a deal. No. I how do you pass that up, though? I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's, You're asking uh, me to leave free baseballs on the table. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, so I don't know. There is some, like, deep part of my brain that was like, maybe that would be fun to try again, and maybe it would be good for me as a writer, I think, sometimes, and maybe it would kind of sharpen some edges that could use sharpening, maybe. Um, so, yeah, I think about it sometimes, but I don't know. I don't know why I feel like you might know and like this movie, but and we were, since we were talking about Canadian stuff earlier. Do you remember, did you ever see a movie called The Wrong Guy with Dave Foley? Of course, yeah. Oh, my God. It was incredible. Love that movie. No, and almost no one knows about it. Because I don't think it came out. It I, didn't I, come out, because yeah. I think it got... It was just, it was part of the, it was kind of what we were talking about. It was sort of the fallout of like a weird political studio thing. Yeah, it was like that Mastermind movie. It was like the Zach Galifianakis movie that just got caught in that exact same situation. Did you ever ever see The Wrong Guy? No. It's, it's great. fucking amazing. It's Dave Foley. Yeah, so far and I'm on Dave board. Dave Higgins is in it as yep. well. And yeah. There's a bunch of funny... It's funny. I was literally people. just talking about this movie like two days ago because I was at Fallon Show and Steve Higgins was there and yes. I was explaining to the person brother, I was with, yeah. I was like, Dave Higgins is in the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> David, uh, who directed it? David... Uh, I can't remember Katie who directed it. up the wrong guy. So uh, the cast and crew just composed of the Daves I know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and Bruce McCullough singing. All like, the kids in the hall are in it at one point or another. Some of them are in I think a couple of them are in it, but essentially... Uh, it's Dave, such a funny idea. It's a genius idea. Dave, at the, basically, the beginning of the movie, Dave Foley walks in on his boss, and his boss, like, he goes in to like tell his boss off, and his boss is dead, and he's convinced that he they're they're gonna think he did it. And so he, he goes on the run. But they immediately know that he didn't that he do didn't it because there's surveillance it. cameras. Yeah, so they're a, basically chasing the criminal across the country, and he thinks they're chasing him. Yeah, but he's just, but they know he didn't do it. <laughs> like, they instantly know that he did not so they do have it. They're no interested in it yeah, whatsoever. It's really funny. It's and he's fun. going through like insane lengths That's to like great, disguise himself. It's a great and, premise. And, it was a, oh, David Steinberg. David Steinberg. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. David Steinberg directed it's it. It's such a funny idea, and it's a funny movie. It's, oh, my God. A really, really that sounds great. Movie. And Dave Higgins yeah. character. Dave Higgins works for the works for like the, like FBI, the FBI. Yeah, and he's basically just using it as an excuse to get the. AP. He's like, oh, we're going to be in New York. We should see a movie. So yeah. we should see a play. So he's basically just using the FBI budget to go do, <laughs> do to like see plays in the cities that yeah, they're in. <laughs> things. Yeah, it's a fucking great. It's it's just one of those great movies that yeah. you know uh, not a lot of people have seen that not that not a lot of not a lot of people have seen. Well, uh, I hope a lot of people see Sausage Party. Thank you. And I hope that... <laughs> Not a sentence you thought you'd be saying. <laughs> <You> probably. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a lemon party. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> no. If you, if you can go to SausageParty.com, it's exactly what you think it would you be. Said to me, you, you said to me like a week ago, you said, it is the filthiest movie I... Not just the filthiest yeah. movie I've ever made. You said it's the filthiest movie I've ever seen. It really... It still shocks me. Like, it is... Uh, <laughs> And it, it's shocking. It, it's a shocking movie. I'm shocked that we got away with it. It's and, and even in in a few more years, I'll look at it and be like, I, it's even more shocking. That we got away with it. But what what happens if you're gonna? What happens if you 
end up having to make a trilogy of them. Oh, it would be amazing. I would love that. I would make sausage movies for the rest of my life. <laughs> I would do. I look at like what Sam Raimi did with those Spider-Man movies and think I would do that with, <laughs> with, 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 with sausages. Just, <laughs> Just all dedicate the way down. a decade of my life to talking hot dogs. Did it? Did it? Uh, did it? Oh, did it, it open this weekend? Yes, yes yeah. August twelfth. August twelfth. And when is this going up, Katie Levine? Oh, it's going up Thursday. Well, there, there you go. Know. Go, go to a midnight out. screening tonight. You could see it. You could totally see it tonight. By the time you've downloaded this and listened to it, I don't know if people listen to the I second think they it do. comes out. So oh, they, oh, they there's do. a segment they of do. the audience that does that. This Actually, one, was, they would. I mean, oh, they, they, go, uh, they see <laughs> Seth's <laughs> name on there. They're going to no, listen. No, Marin, exactly. but they'll give it a shot. <laughs> I get to hear Seth Rogen only audio. Perfect. Just have that laugh in my ears and that's it. Finally. <laughs> That's a ringtone. Everyone's be dream, some, yeah. <laughs> be someone's fucking ringtone. <laughs> I'm sure it is. Uh, when so, they all hear it as a ringtone. What's funny is there's a guy who lives in West Hollywood who has a McLovin license plate, <laughs> and I see him periodically. And every time I see him, he's just embarrassed, and he's like not happy to see me. Like, he's just like, oh, I'm sorry. like I didn't think this would happen. And the first time I saw him was in a parking lot, and he it was it's a convertible. So I w- literally like walked up to it like as he was pulling out of his car. And it was, he was there with his wife or something, and I was like, "Hey!" <laughs> and literally, his wife looked at me and it said, "I told you this was going to happen one day." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the guy was like, oh, fuck. I'm sorry. I'm like, sorry. I knew. Yeah. I just didn't think it through. I didn't think it through. Like, these, I was, these are forever. I was like, no, it's fine. Really yeah. dealt. He made a life decision yeah. to do that. Yeah. That's it's insane. Cool. I'm happy about that. I like it. <laughs> he must, be, on some level, even though his wife gave he him probably, shit. probably, yeah. And that was cool. Yeah. On some level, when she said, I told this would happen inside, he was like, I knew this would yeah, happen. Finally, yeah, it happened. Yeah, I finally. told you this would happen. Finally, totally valid. Uh, it is always a delight to chat with you, Seth. Rogen. You too, thank man. You so thank much. you. And uh, thanks again for doing the preacher after show. Hey, both my times. pleasure. Thank really you. Fun. All that right, good time. Enjoy your burrito, everyone. <laughs> the end. Now leaving Nerdist.com. Enjoy your burrito. 